All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us today, folks. Um, as mentioned, uh, we have a fantastic uh, panel here. I won't introduce everybody all over again, but uh, here's me. Um, I, uh, I'm a principal analyst at uh, Omdia. I cover uh, AI hardware, including uh, semiconductors and uh, uh, systems, uh, primarily in the uh, cloud and data center area. Uh, yeah, we've uh, gone through this, so I'm not going to uh, elaborate on this. But uh, um, so, uh, what? Uh, uh, before we get started, uh, I just wanted to see uh, with our audience here uh, who we have uh, with us. Uh, uh, could I get a show of hands of how many people in the audience uh, today um, actually are, um, represent uh, enterprise end user companies? Okay. Uh, uh, how many are uh, technology vendors? Okay. Well, that's that's a pretty good chunk of the audience here. Um, how many uh, folks here represent service providers? Right. Okay. And then, uh, last but not least, uh, investors. Uh, do we have anybody representing uh, that area here? Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, this is this is a pretty good representation with a strong uh, uh, representation of the tech vendors and the service provider side of things. So I'm going to start with this uh, this slide. Um, you know, if you really want to uh, understand uh, truly how ready enterprises are ready organizationally for AI, uh, we can look at what we're calling the Omdia AI Readiness Barometer. Uh, the barometer is a tool uh, for enterprises to measure and benchmark uh, their AI readiness compared to their peers uh, across several metrics. Uh, using this tool, uh, companies uh, can fill out a questionnaire to determine where they stand on the AI readiness scale. Uh, there are four stages on this scale, uh, beginner, competent, uh, proficient, and advanced. Um, so in the uh, beginner stage, uh, we have uh, enterprises that are just engaging in an assessment of the technology. Um, moving on to the AI competent, uh, we have those companies that have uh, achieved a level of organizational and strategic preparedness where they're ready to implement AI. Uh, AI proficiency, uh, that means companies that have some practical experience um, and an understanding of how to move ahead with AI implementations. Um, and uh, to be AI advanced, of course, means to have a good level of AI experience and expertise. Each transition to the next level uh, presents uh, unique major challenges for enterprises. Um, in, this in, th in this discussion, uh, we are largely looking at a transition here um, uh, from AI beginner to AI competent. Uh, why? Uh, because to a uh, attain AI competency, uh, organizations should establish the organizational setup required to implement AI and move on to the next level. Looking a little deeper at the AI readiness journey, uh, the AI read readiness model is based on four functional areas that are the critical foundations of any AI-driven enterprise strategy, technology, operations, and data and organization. So as a best practice, uh, uh, Omnia advises that organizations invest in their AI strategy and organization first. Well, it's not always the case for all organizations. Uh, the time when companies uh, should establish their AI organization should be at that beginner stage. And well in this initial stage, companies should start laying the groundwork for AI by firstly investing in the plan, that is the strategy, and the human capital, that's the organization. This should logically lead to investment and results in places where t results are concretely measured, uh, that is technology, uh, operations, and uh, data. Um, so where do companies stand in the AI readiness journey now? Um, Omnia's AI readiness barometer indicates that most companies uh, view themselves as being in the AI competent stage, uh, where they are, should have already established AI organizations uh, that pave the way for deployment uh, and uh, AI proficiency. More than half of organizations rate themselves as AI competent, per the, fi uh, per the figure shown. Now, interestingly, uh, if you look over on the right here, um, a plurality of uh, enterprises feel like uh, organization is an area of strength, um, with a larger share, 44%, uh, indicating they're proficient at uh, AI readiness. Another 11% regard the state of their organizational AI readiness to be advanced. Uh, however, 
uh, at the same time, 17% uh, of survey respondents indicate they have uh, beginner status when it comes to organizational AI readiness. Uh, this compares to 11% for overall AI readiness. Uh, this means that a disproportionate number of enterprises feel they have some work to do in areas including organization before they're ready to move on to the next phases and begin to work in earnest on deploying AI projects. Um, so with that, uh, I think we've set the stage for a discussion here um, of uh, working with our panelists to, to agree on some questions that are going to probe uh, at uh, the issue of AI organizational readiness. Um, so uh, I just wanted to uh, start off uh, by throwing out a question, and this one will actually be addressed uh, to, to one, of our, uh, one of our panelists. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Jerry. Um, Jerry, um, if you're early in the AI readiness phase, um, what kind of steps, maybe particularly organizational steps, uh, should you take to become more AI ready? Sure, thanks, John. Um, so let's assume that you're on the AI competent, like early part of that. I would say that you'd probably need to focus on two things. One is around ensuring that you get value out of your AI projects. Um, and the second thing is around scale. Now with regards to value, I would say a couple of things that you, an organization needs to be prepared to do. One is to be able to assess what's the right projects to work on in terms of AI. So that's looking at value as well as feasibility, because you don't want to be going down a path where it takes a long time to, to develop something. Um, secondly, you want to make sure that you get multiple people involved, like the lines of business. You don't want to be working off on your own in a lab and then finding that, oh, it's not really something that the business wanted to do and didn't really help them get to where they wanted to go. Um, thirdly, you probably want to try to figure out how to establish some kind of competence or comfort in terms of the development of the AI models themselves. You know, every organization is going to want to use their own approach, so you kind of have to find that. And then fourthly, you want to make sure that you can actually deploy the models and then see that you got some value out of that, right, uh, and then some, some learnings. Now, in terms of scale, it's really about speed and, and developing uh, capacity. So on the, what you want to do is you want to make sure that everyone that wants to do AI and wants to start working with the data, that they're able to do so. You don't want to shut anyone out. And so this means that you're going to have to be able to uh, accommodate people who are very technical as, people, as well as people who are not so technical so that they can work on the same uh, projects and they can work on them really fast because the worst thing is like, People are, you're working on a project, it takes a long time to get it deployed because you have questions around the data, you have questions around how to, how to manipulate it, you have questions around what's the right algorithm to use, so you want everyone to be on that same platform. Um, secondly, you want to make sure that you can deploy those models at scale. So at one point, like it's great if you can deploy a model, and then you're going to have to watch over that model because at some point it might decay or there might be problems with the data pipelines. So you're going to have to make sure that you, want, you monitor that and you want to be able to do that at scale over large volumes of, of things. And then the third thing that we want to do is make sure that we have some governance around this. So, you know, we talked about we want to get everyone involved, but the problem is, is everyone does it a little bit differently, so there isn't consistency with things. Quality might be a problem. So if we can try to get some governance around it, meaning like some process, some, some ways that uh, things comply with, let's say, regulatory requirements or even company in, uh, requirements, then you'll start to be able to get a lot of scale out of that. Does that make sense? Great. Yeah, perfectly. Um, would uh, any other members of the panel care to uh, comment on that same question? Yeah, and so, um, like Jerry, you know, if you're familiar at all with what DDN does, you know, we're on-premises scalable storage systems to, um, you know, speed up AI pipelines um, and analytics, and the things that we're seeing our customers grapple with is similar to you know what Jerry mentioned. Is you know planning for success is one of the big things, right? You do a POC, everything works just fine with existing infrastructure because you know you're dealing with data at data at scales that operate on you know smaller. Um, data sets and, and, and don't require, as Jerry was saying, maybe the speed of access, the speed of processing, that once you start throwing production workloads and then being even more successful and extending um, that, that application out to more users um, and, and more opportunities 
where things, again, start to decay, maybe from an infrastructure standpoint, right? You're not getting the speed out of the algorithms that you used to when you're in POC because now you're sharing these resources with more and more people or trying to get more and more data um, into the repositories. And so customers are struggling with this question also of where do I deploy this, right? Um, you know, there's plenty of platforms out there, cloud platforms that are very well developed and probably quick to implement. And then we have customers who are building things completely from the ground up um, and trying to understand, okay, you know, what exactly is my infrastructure going to look like? And um, especially five years from now, right? And each stage, do I need to re-architect my infrastructure to be able to move forward into the next step, the next realize the next innovation or the next breakthrough. Um, and if you're constantly having to look at the underlying architecture, migrate between architectures and things like that, that's gonna potentially hamper how quickly you can move through the stages. Yeah, great insights there. Uh, anyone else wanna comment on this one? Um, yeah, a quick comment. I largely agree with uh, what Jerry said. I think he really articulated the things that uh, we have to think through carefully at that stage. Um, I want to reemphasize the point around being incremental in your approach, right? So I think you want to take on some challenges that will give you some quick wins because there might be skepticism even within the organization if you are at that stage, rightfully so. So you have this you know, burden of proof, so you want to get some quick wins to build that social capital to invest in the longer term, right? So it does mean that there will be a trade-off to be made, right? So you will accumulate some tech debt because you are focused on getting some initial quick wins, but if you do it intentionally, that pays for itself, and you you have the social capital to make advances in the future, right? To do it in a more principled way. Another aspect, typically, that people need to be mindful of at that stage, and it's a very crucial stage when you're starting out on an AI journey in an existing organization, is you might look around to see what else is any, everybody else doing, and you have to be super careful when you do that, right? So there are obviously some really good best practices that you can adopt. Um, there are lots of advances happening that you have to you have to be mindful of, but you know people will choose their individual mountains to climb, and they will reach a plateau. And so when you reach that plateau, uh, it's very difficult. Like there will be a lot of swirl. It's very difficult to get out of it because of the inertia that you have there. And so you have to pick the right mountain to climb for yourself, if I can use that metaphor, um, and not just like look at what someone else in that space is doing, and adopt their strategy for uh, machine learning or AI. Ramona, do you want to comment on this, or should we move on to the next question? You can move in, and I can uh, loop in some, some comments that have addressed. Sounds great. OK. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. I'm going to try to speak closer to the mic. Um, we can move on to the next question, or I can elaborate a bit on this one. Yeah, you want to start by uh, elaborating a little bit. Uh, it's interesting to hear the different uh, panel members' uh, comments on this single question. So, yeah, if you have uh, some thoughts on that, then we can transition to the next question. Yeah, I came across a very interesting article the other day about how a organizations that go through this change with AI um, kind of have, have to rethink a lot of things. And basically, there is a framework around what we call critical capabilities for these organizations to move um, so first of all, the skills, so the skills that we have in-house for whoever is going to tackle this AI initiative, then the resources, and, and Kurt and Jerry touched a bit on that, around the infrastructure, the data that we have available, etc. And then last, the culture, right? And culture is really the most important aspect that you start with when you're going through this kind of um, organizational change, because you need people to adopt your vision and follow through, right? Um, so I think that if you if you go a bit backwards, you would um, you would first explain the why behind this initiative. Like, why are we adopting AI? How is that going to make us different in the space? Is this going to be a strategic advantage for us in the market, or is it going to help us solve some problems that we have internally? Right. So I think that looking at the problem from this perspective, um, it will also, to Kurt's point, um, maybe speed up the process and, and then bring more success to the initiative. Great, fantastic insights. Um, so uh, addressing this question, uh, starting with uh, Ramona, um, which parts of the organization uh, play a role in the AI journey? Um, and what could the roles be and what role do customers play in that journey? That's a great question. Um, so I'm gonna piggyback a bit on what Ash Ashkosh was saying. Um, so I think it depends very much where we are in the AI journey. So we are at the beginning in the AI journey um, and you know, like, 
you know the value that the AI, the AI can provide for the organization. Um, you, you have some assumptions about problems that you have, but you have never experimented with it. The, the team is going to be very different, right? So you're going to look in-house and see if you can have skills that you can actually bring in. And that can be very expensive, right? Because you have to hire a lot of people that are specialized in doing something, or you can uh, look uh, out and outsource these services to uh, uh, providers that are actually doing this um, you know, as their bread and butter. Um, as you move, for instance, to the other chain, to the other stage, being closer to the AI com competent, um, you can maybe, um, you know, like you think of organizations that know something about AI and how it can create value for them. So they are sold in the value. They also probably did some POC or POV, and they sold the immediate value. But now they want to productivize this, so they want to. Scale, scale up. So for them, the team can be different, um, and I'll come to that in a second. And third, more broadly, you're looking at organizations that um, actually are expanding the use of AI, right? So they, are, they, are, they have maybe did this for a line of business, they are expanding this to another line of business. So depending on this, you will have a different type of team inside the organization. I think that the most important thing is this idea to have a champion for the change, right? So we need the champion to actually sell us on the vision, tell us what are the implications, explain the why, and also understand how this will change your organization, how will it make the organization more efficient, more strategic, or in some cases will solve some problems that people have internally because they are not efficient or productive enough. Once we have this, um, this let's say, um, this champion, we're going to look at partnering with somebody that has AI expertise. So I call that the AI strategist, um, somebody like Jerry here who comes in and has uh, actually the possibility to transform the business goals and vision into requirements for AI and data, right? And coming back to this is how we scale also, right? And this person will also bring together the team that will the technical team that will actually implement the AI solution. And this team can be um, you know, uh, um, made of um, data engineers, data scientists, uh, platform engineers, um, people with technical background that actually can implement the strategy. Um, but also, there is um, an aspect with the subject matter experts that need to be also consulted. And then, so they make up for the technical team, but as we heard before from, from other discussions today, if you don't have a blended team with people that actually will understand how the solution will work and how it will help them, it, it's not going to succeed. So in the organizations, you also need this notion of customer, whether it's internal or external. So internal customer would be any business analyst or data analyst that will actually see the benefit of using the solution. For instance, you know, using this, uh, this solution helped us, uh, I don't know, manage... 10 more 10 more uh, 10 times more claims than we usually do let's say that's an example so that you know having this this uh, proof that the uh, technology uh, actually works and, and delivers on the promise it's going to help with adoption and i think that for organizational change and for the kind of teams that we're setting up we want to be sure that there is alignment like why are we doing this um so that we can also reduce resistance uh, how is this going to help us and what it will entail if we don't do this? So what's the risk, right? So I would like to wrap up with a very nice metaphor that I came across also the other day. So you're either showing them the, got, the, the gold pot, so you show them what, the, what's in it for them, or you also show them the alligator, right? So if we don't this, do this, we're going to die, right? So um, that's my take on this. Well, that's a, that's a great metaphor. That I think that would motivate just about anybody. Uh, <laughs> just out of curiosity, you mentioned the the uh, the role of uh, you know the kind of the AI champion out there. Uh, are you the AI champion within your organization? <laughs> no, I'm my customer's champion. So um, based on the experience that I have with customers as a customer success director, I saw that you know sometimes um, the the project doesn't get adopted because there is no understanding in the why. Right, so, and because we want to keep this top bottom, so the decision maker that sees the benefit for the business, they make the decision to go on an AI journey. And people in the organization create this sense making around it like we're going to be fired or, you know, like we're going to have to learn new, to do new, new things. So I think that if you don't start with that at the very beginning, even, you know, like talk to people that have no connection with the implementation whatsoever, you will get a lot of resistance. And if you get resistance, you will never be able to actually fully implement this. So I think that um, it's based on what I've seen with, what I've seen with, my, with my clients. So that, that's why we're doing this, this kind of alignment from the very beginning of, of a project. It's what we call success plan, right? To make sure that we we're going to have success on both sides, both at their initiative and for our work with them. 
Uh, great. Uh, before we move on to the next question, did anyone else want to comment? Uh, yeah, just really quick. Um, I think one thing to me that's interesting is taking this from maybe two perspectives, answering your original question was, um, you know, who's going to be affected? Um, and, and I think, you know, maybe the pithy answer is, right, everybody. Um, and it's interesting to, we're working with one of our customers, University of Florida, who is now basically requiring every single one of their students, no matter what school they're in, to get trained, to take at least uh, one or two AI courses, right? To understand, you know, how it's gonna impact their industry, whether they're journalism majors or English majors or political science majors or, you know, electrical engineers, they're all, right, gonna be impacted. So we all are, whether we're customers or whether we're you know, um, working in a company. And, and the other um, side of this coin, right, is when we talk about AI solutions, um, and even, you know, we struggle with it as a company when we're articulating some of the things that we're talking about from the infrastructure standpoint, right? We talk to AI, we talk to IT, and we're talking about automation and AI that we're building into our systems, right? To assist them so that they don't have to do all of the infrastructure stuff that they used to have to do. But then also our storage systems are accelerating the AI itself, so enabling the data scientists to do things faster. And so when you're trying to articulate this from a marketing standpoint, sometimes it's a, it's a bit of a struggle because you call yourself AI storage, but what does that mean, right? Um, and, and how does that impact? a customer's AI workflow. Fantastic. Uh, anyone else want to comment? Uh, Jerry? Yeah, just in terms of um, the organizations or the people in an organization that should be involved, I, I think most of us would say, hey, for any technology, it takes a village to get something built out. And I think that's absolutely true with AI. The only thing that I would say that maybe is differentiated with AI from other technologies is that you really require someone who understands the model, the model outputs, and how does that translate to business? So in other words, can you translate that business problem into an AI problem to be able to make sure you impact that business? So that's probably the only major difference for me. The second thing I would say is in terms of like where customers play a role, um, you know, one of the reasons I joined analytics is because it is so, it is the, the technology that is so closest to the business that you can really impact the business. So the customers are there because, you know, the business is serving that customer. So customers provide you use cases. When you're trying to solve problems, it's problems that the customers have in order to be able to impact either the top line or the bottom line. So there are many cases where organizations have tried to improve things for the customer, let's say preventive maintenance and try to reduce the amount of time something goes down for their customer. And as a result of that, they've been able to turn that into a revenue generator. So that's one pretty cool thing about AI. The other side of it is, when you're trying to help the customers through your own internal business processes, AI can help you try to streamline those internal business processes. So it really helps on, on both sides of the equation. All right, so if, uh, Ashok, would you like to comment on that one? Yeah. Okay, we can move on to the next question in that case. Um, this next question is uh, for uh, Kurt. Um, what is the balance people have found around technology readiness versus organizational readiness, uh, especially as AI initiatives advance and organizations look to possibly centralize AI technology res resources and data management to scale? Uh, these can get out of sync, and no amount of technology can overcome misaligned organizations. Uh, similarly, an organization could be prepared and fully aligned, but without the correct infrastructure in place, and that organization will struggle with uh, production, applications, and growth. Yeah, I, I think we've seen this around data, you know, and it's not just an AI thing, um, you know, around data sharing, um, around data governance. Um, Jerry talked about it, right? Allow, you know, there's this idea of the democratization of data. Um, and we've gone back, uh, you know, 15 years to customers who wanted to be able to do inter-organizational sharing, 
So for instance, we worked, again, going back to Florida, um, you know, there was a bunch of colleges who got together and they wanted to be able to share data between each other to do research and things like that. Um, but you get into the conflicts of, oh, well, each of them has a different security protocol. And so who owns the data? Um, who is in charge of setting the security standard if one school and another school has a different standard for access and how their students get on and things like that. And I think it's similar um, with AI in that, you know, some organizations, right, are going to empower individual either groups or even people, right? The data scientist with a GPU system under their desk, right, is, is probably very productive in a small silo, um, but, you know, you run into data governance, governance issues, also depending on the industry, right? How do you match that up to regulatory requirements? Um, and so the considerations, right, get more and more complex as the challenges you're addressing get bigger and bigger, um, and, and you're trying to create that additional value. Um, and so it, it's definitely a tension that we constantly see is that um, idea of, you know, democratization of data while at the same time we're now all scared of you know bad actors out there and are they gonna attack us with ransomware so we want to make it easy to access but only easy to access for the people who get access to it and um, yeah I think that's just something uh, over time that we need to address and you know uh, hopefully AI helps us with that too <laughs> great uh, any other panelists want to comment on that uh, that topic all right well then uh, we will move on uh, next question is uh, for Ashok um, what are uh, some organizational capabilities uh, that drive AI success? Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you think of uh, data science or machine learning or AI, if you will, um, the primary role in many industries is in improving decision making, right, and scaling that decision making, right? So uh, from that lens, when you look at uh, the, the role of uh, machine learning, uh, it, it becomes obvious like what you need to pay attention to the most in terms of core capabilities. First of all is you know data, as many people have mentioned here before, like data, your data strategy, and you know um, how you organize your data, your data engineering capabilities become the first important thing at an organizational level. And then you have analytics. You know you can get so much done with analytics uh, before you even need like uh, you know machine learning or AI. Uh, you know and can run a business quite effectively, make big improvements to it, right? Uh, and then you have data science or machine learning itself that helps in that next journey of sort of scaling up uh, and improving the decision making. And it depends on the specific area of the business that you're applying machine learning to, right? So I, I'm leading personalization efforts at uh, HBO Max within WarnerMedia, uh, but WarnerMedia uses machine learning across a bunch of areas, right? So for marketing, to find new subscribers, uh, to promote content or to help them understand what the service is, to understand content itself, right? So we, we have a fantastic sort of content buying team, but they need help in understanding the catalog overall. You know, what role will a particular piece of content play in the catalog? Uh, what is the built-in target audience for it? What are other similar titles to it and so on? So machine learning can help generate those insights in the service of sort of specific stakeholder uh, requirements, right? And then of course, product itself, right? So understanding the customers, their preferences, their viewing patterns, to, so, that, so that we can best connect the uh, specific subscriber to the, you know, the content that we have on the service, right? So each of these areas will have different implications on scalability, different implications on latency, and so other capabilities have to be set up accordingly, right? So MLOps and DevOps, software engineering or machine learning platform, these things have to be set up to deal with the wide variation in the kinds of requirements uh, for scale across these various uh, use cases. Um, but I would say like the, probably the most important thing at the organization level is sort of at the intersection of capability and culture, which is around experimentation, right? I think experimentation is central, like you have to pay a lot of attention to it. It has a wonderful way of clarifying what we need to solve. Um, you know, there'll, there'll often be swirl, like different people will have different perspectives on what to, um, what to solve for, how to solve it, and so on, and if you have a good, strategy around experimentation, that can clarify things really well. Um, you'll have a common ground for different people with the different perspectives to sort of weigh their opinions on. Um, 
you know, and then it, it like the democratization of data, like you know, you're, you that leads to sort of democratization of decision making and impact, right? Because you're no longer in the space where uh, decision making is done through like force of personality or leadership. Everybody has ideas, but these ideas are hypotheses. And if you have a good experimentation sort of strategy in place, you can put them in, try it out, see what happens, right? Um, and and that way you can actually be more causal in the in the way you sort of uh, improve your business as opposed to making sort of correlational decisions, right? So that is a critical capability that, you know, it may not be possible in all settings. In some cases, you may not have the scale to do experiments, but even then, if you think about you know, decision-making through the lens of experimentation, I think it can sort of dramatically improve the outcomes. Um, yeah, and it's often easy to set up like a basic experimentation platform, right? Like a few people can come together within a span of months if they know what they're doing and set up a pretty good experimentation system, but there are also like outside vendors for these things. Um, and so you can, you know, sort of adopt it as a first principle, as a best practice, even at the very beginning of your AI journey. Yeah, uh, Ramona. Yes, thank you. That that's very useful. I am. Um, I was thinking from from what you're saying also that maybe there is also a shift from what we have function centric to to process centric. So decisions should not be taken only top bottom, but also bottom up. And the more the earlier you involve people in making these decisions, the more you augment their capabilities and they feel empowered to to do this this kind of transformation. Um, so th there is one. That's one way to look at it. And another way to look at it would be to build, to, to your point, this kind of um, interdisciplinary collaboration, so that everybody feels like they are taking part of this. And even if they fail, they can learn from what they, uh, you know, they failed on and improve. And it, that also changes this uh, organizational mindset from something that is. Uh, risk adverse to taking risks, right? And and we know that AI, it's it's not magic. It requires a lot of work, investment, iterations. People need small wins, right? And if we're able to leverage that in an organization, for them to see proof, that will build confidence also. And at the organizational level, it will also enable people to do more and have confidence that they will get to the outcome that they expect. On that thought, though, um, you know, the proof point, I think, is often... Um, interesting in that I'll, I'll talk about it now from a kind of a more user perspective, right? In that, you know, everybody's coming out of the woodwork now with their next AI app that's going to help me as a marketer, right? With my demand gen organization, they're going to you know, have these AI tools and everybody's starting to AI wash their applications, right? Uh, no matter what they're doing internally, it's, uh, it's AI, right? Um, and so also, you know, developing the sophistication to be able to see through some of those claims, um, to be able to evaluate vendor claims um, as you're looking to balance, right? Uh, you know, either build it yourself um, or use an external vendor to help you um, move forward with the transformation. Yeah, I'll just uh, go back a little bit to kind of this balance and then also the experimentation and um, organizational capabilities. At Data IQ, we think of it in terms of like three tensions. I think uh, you brought that up right here, three tensions. And I think those are necessary tensions and, and good tensions to be around. So on the one hand, you want people to be creative and kind of do their own thing and be able to explore what's most interesting to them. You know, on the other hand, it has to follow some kind of process so it doesn't totally go off the rail. Um, so that's one tension. Another tension would be around individuals being um, like focused on specific subjects that they want to explore and letting them go off and do that because they're going to be passionate about that and it's going to be interesting to them and they're going to work really hard. On the other hand, all that work, all the stuff that they create somehow has to benefit the organization as a whole. Right? So those assets have to be reusable or, or stored in some place. And then on the third tension, it's one around, all right, we know that we have to do kind of boring daily stuff just to keep the lights on and just to keep things moving, but we want to take those moonshots every now and then, right? the experiment, and, and do something totally uh, interesting and, and maybe really far away from what we're doing today, but it's a step change improvement from what we're trying to do. So I think trying to balance those tensions um, those are maybe one way of looking about uh, thinking about achieving that balance and then also trying to build up organizational capabilities. 
Great. Uh, really interesting insights. And, uh, you know, we've hit a whole bunch of different angles on this. It's really fascinating to hear the, the perspectives on everyone here. Um, we're, uh, we're getting near the end of our time with about uh, four minutes left. Um, so um, we, we've touched on this in some of the comments here. But I, I want to ask, uh, what is the biggest organizational challenge that can cause a company's AI initiative to fall uh, short of objectives? And uh, whoever would like to take that. I'll go ahead, Jerry. <laughs> uh, sure, got the <laughs> mic my hand. Um, yeah, I think probably the, the biggest one is, uh, well, you talked about it, Ashok, fear of experimentation. At some point, you're going to have to try and start. Um, I think um, experimenting in a, in a safe environment or one where maybe you, you try to um, keep it constrained might be the, the right approach. Um, I think a lot of people feel like AI is this big nebulous kind of scary thing and that whenever they think about it They think about like robots and you know that kind of stuff But actually AI has a lot of very practical applications within the business environment And I think trying to get an, an understanding of that would, would probably be the, the, the biggest key Um, so I will second what Jerry said, but also to some extent you have what we call misalignment between the business objectives that are set and actually the, the expectations that are going to be driven by the AI. So that's, that's what I see the most often, right? So um, because there is that misalignment, it creates um, this, this kind of resistance, right? So we told you so, this is going to fail, right? So if you start from the very beginning when you define that vision and you tell people why you're doing this and you align their expectations with the objectives that you have, then it's going to be easier, right? Because even if you have to experiment and go through a lot of iterations before you reach that time to value, you will build that foundation that we have the same goal. We're doing this to be more efficient or to, you know, to be more productive or to solve this customer's problem that we couldn't do because we can't scale as humans, right? So I think that um, for, for me, that, that misalignment, it's, you know, that creates also resistance and we need to have that culture of it's, it's good to experiment. This is the future, everybody does it. And we also have to be, you know, like to, to be aligned, right? To work as a team. Otherwise, uh, we will end up with creating solutions that are not adopted and it will not, we will not see that ROI. Yeah, so um, I think Jerry mentioned it, and then I think all of us may have at least thrown the word out there, uh, but the word scale, right? And being able to scale this thing, especially getting away from maybe kind of improving operationally, but really if you're using data as the central way to transform your business, create differentiation, create new value, understanding, right, that today's experiment that you're doing is probably very small. And where does success ultimately end up? And, and what's it gonna look like to be able to implement that fully successful thing? How much of that, how is that gonna, what is that gonna cost you from just a pure acquisition standpoint to be able to realize that success? And then understanding how you do that most easily. Well, fantastic. I think we are now uh, at the end of our allotted time. I want to thank uh, this excellent panel with, uh, you know, really great firsthand observations and experiences in this area. Uh, I found it very valuable, and I hope you all did, too. Thanks very much. I appreciate the audience's attention. Thank you.